Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 6. After the earlier introductory videos, we are finally ready to talk about numerical analysis. In this video, we will talk about interpolation, in particular Lagrange polynomial interpolation. This is a very fundamental topic in numerical analysis because, as you can see in this concept map, uh, interpolation can serve as a basis for derivation of several numerical schemes, including numerical differentiation and uh, numerical integration. Um, as we will see in future lectures, these schemes can be used to solve ordinary and partial differential equations. So let's suppose that we have a function f and it's a real function defined in the interval a to b and uh, let's suppose that it's a smooth function up to some degree n plus 1. And let's suppose that we know the function values at a set of distinct nodes x, i, and the function values are, are f of x, i, and we will denote them as f, i for shorthand. Um, we want to find the collocation polynomial uh, that goes through this set of nodes. If we have n plus 1 points, then the degree of that polynomial will be n. This polynomial is unique and it can be determined by solving a linear system of collocation conditions. Uh, the conditions are p of xi equals fi. Um, so if we simply write down these conditions and substitute this expression, then we will obtain a linear system for the coefficients c i or c j. And solving this system will give us the interpolating polynomial. This procedure is called the method of undetermined coefficients. And we will do an example of this in Mathematica. But before we do that, let me point out that the solution may be written analytically in the Lagrange form. P of x equals sum over fj pj of, of x, where pj of x are the Lagrange basis polynomials. And these Lagrange basis polynomials can be written in this form. This is a product of x minus xk over xj minus xk. Um, and this is a product over the values of k from 0 to n, excluding the value k equals j, because in this case the denominator will, would vanish. And you can see that by construction, these polynomials satisfy the conditions uh, pj of xi equals delta ij, where delta ij is a Kronecker delta. Um, and you can check that uh, this condition guarantees that the polynomial p of x satisfies the collocation conditions p of xi equals fi. This is because if I substitute x equals xi here, then I have a pj of xi here. And because pj of xi is delta ij, uh, delta ij contracted with fj means that only the term fi survives in this sum. So this means that p of xi equals fi. So the collocation conditions are uh, automatically satisfied by this solution. Um, so far, we have not specified what the nodes are. Um, for polynomials of low degree, one often uses equidistant nodes. For example, we can use uh, the nodes xi uh, that are given by this expression. Um, so here we have n distinct nodes that are equidistant. Uh, uh, in the interval from A to B. 
Now this choice is only recommended for polynomials of low degree, uh, but if you try and use this for polynomials of high degree, uh, for a large number of points, you may run into trouble. Uh, in particular, you may run into the Runge phenomenon, which we will see shortly. Okay, so let's consider a concrete example. Let's suppose we have a function f of x, and we want to interpolate that function in three points, x1, x2, x3. And we're given those, those points, and the function values at those points, f1, is f of x1, f2, which is f of x2, and f3, which is f of x3. Uh, the polynomial that goes through those three points uh, has to be second order, because then it will have three unknown coefficients, which we can solve for um, based on these three collocation conditions. So let's go into Mathematica and define such a polynomial P of X underscore equals um, we can use the palette and use the sum symbol here. Um, let's suppose that the coefficients are named C I and each monomial is x to the power i, and i goes from 0 to the power, up to the power 2. So this is a second order polynomial, in other words, a parabola. And the set of equations we want to solve for uh, are these collocation conditions. So we can put those in a list and call this list equations or x. And the first element in this list would be, let's say, p of x 0 or p of x 1. And uh, that would be f 1. And the next element in the list would be p of x2 equals f2. And the third element would be p of x3 equals f3. Shift return and we have entered the list. And we see here that we get uh, three equations uh, that are linear in the coefficients c, c0, c1, and c2. So let me maximize this. And actually, I'm going to change notation a little bit to be consistent uh, with the formula in the presentation earlier. I'm going to call this point x0, f0 x1, f1, and x2, f2. And um, again, the unknowns are these coefficients, c0, c1, and c2. And then I can tell Mathematica that. So let's call these unknowns. And we put those in a list again. So c0, C1 and C2. And shift return. Okay, so to solve this system of equations, we can do it that by hand. It's a linear system, it's a 3 by 3 system. Uh, but Mathematica can do it for us. If you don't remember how to solve systems, you can go back and watch lecture one, where we showed how to solve uh, systems of algebraic equations in Mathematica. The command to do that is the solve command. You can type question mark and then solve and look at the documentation uh, on how to solve these systems. So I can simply type solve. Uh, and here I can 
put the list of equations because I've already defined the list here I can just type equations and then comes the list of unknowns and because I've already defined the list of unknowns I can just type this uh, and then ask Mathematica to solve the system so shift return and Mathematica gives me this unique solution so uh, let's call this solution solve and let's try and simplify it you can use the command simplify uh, or you can use the command full simplify to try and simplify it further uh, it looks like the c2 coefficient was simplified a little bit and you can see that Mathematica gives a solution as a list of replacement rules so c0 right arrow this expression and c1 is given by this expression and so on so now if i type p of x and then slash dot and then come the replacement rules so the replacement will, rules will be c uh, zero uh, given by something and and so on so in other words i can just type slash dot solution one and then this command will take the polynomial p of x and replace each coefficient ci by these rules so if i do that mathematica will substitute the coefficients into the polynomial and this is the interpolating polynomial that I'm looking for. So I can simplify this expression. Let's try full simplify. So this simplified it quite a bit. And I can call this, I can give it a name. So I can call this P solution of X and define it to be a function of X. So now I can check whether this satisfies the collocation conditions I described earlier. So let's try and substitute, let's say, x0 to this polynomial. And I get f0, which is uh, the collocation condition, uh, the first collocation condition. Let's try x1. And we get this expression if we simplify it there's a cancellation between the numerator and the denominator and we get f1 and if we substitute x2 we get f2 so these are exactly the collocation conditions that polynomial should satisfy uh, so this is uh, the unique interpolating polynomial that goes through these three points Mathematica has a built-in function to construct an interpolating polynomial um, and the command is uh, exactly that. It's, it's called interpolating polynomial. Um, and you can look at math the mathematical documentation to see um, how you can uh, request Mathematica to build such a polynomial. The syntax is uh, for Lagrange interpolation, you can give the points, uh, the X and Y data points, and then the parameter X or the argument of the polynomial X. So in our case, uh, the, the points would be x0 comma f0 that's the first point that the polynomial needs to go through the second point is x1 comma f1 and the third point is x2 comma f2 and if i ask mathematica to give me the interpolating polynomial that goes through these points this is what Mathematica gives me. 
So you might want to check whether this polynomial is the same as this polynomial. Uh, so let's call this P Mathematica of X. And let's compare it to our own solution. So if I try, for example, P math of X minus P solution of X, the result should be zero. I don't get zero right away because uh, these expressions are written slightly differently, but I can try and simplify and then indeed we get zero. So uh, that's what we should get because the polynomial is unique. And it's unique because the solution to the linear system we solved to find the polynomial, uh, a solution to a linear system is unique. Okay, so what we just described is the method of undetermined coefficients of finding the interpolating polynomial. Uh, but you can check that if you use the Lagrange interpolation formula, uh, you will get the same result. And uh, we will use the Lagrange interpolation formula in uh, future examples. But for now, let's do a concrete example. So let's consider this function. Uh, I can use the palette to uh, input a, a fraction, 1 plus 25x uh, squared. And then let's suppose I want to uh, interpolate in the interval from minus 0 0.1 to b equals 0 0.1 and let's suppose I want to interpolate five points actually let's try three points first as uh, an example just to show a parabolic interpolation uh, of, with the polynomial that we just derived so we can construct a list of grid points. Let's call that list x. And I construct I can construct using the range command or the table command. So let's try table. And then the points are equidistant and start from a and then they increase linearly. So let's suppose we have an index i and uh, here we should put the, the 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 grid spacing and the grid spacing is b minus a divided by the number of grid points and then the index i will take values from 0 to n and let's close that and hit shift enter Okay, so this actually gave me four points uh, because n is the number of intervals here, not the number of grid points. Um, so if I want the number of points to be three, n should be two. And now I have those th three points. To construct the interpolating polynomial, we can uh, use the formula that we just derived, or we can just use the Mathematica command to build it. Um, so to do that, we need a list of X and Y points. Uh, so let's build a list of Y points first. So Y will be uh, F of X. So X is this list of grid points and we pass that list into F. F is a listable function. So if I pass a list into it, it will calculate uh, F of each of the components of that list. Um, so indeed, uh, it, this function th threaded through the list X and 
I get a list of uh, y values f of x i. But now the issue is uh, I have to pair those points. So x0 with f0, x1 with f1, and so on, and bring them into this form uh, right here in order to pass it into the interpolating polynomial function. So to do that, um, I can pair x and y like this. But as we've uh, shown before in uh, lecture two, this is not in this form. You need to transpose this. So if I just say transpose x and y, then I get the pairs that I need uh, in, in, in this form that we need. So now I can say, let's call this polynomial capital P of X. And that's an interpolating polynomial. And we can pass this list. Uh, let's call this list X, Y. So we will pass, pass this X, Y list into interpolating polynomial command and we will specify that the argument of the polynomial will be the variable x. Okay, so now if I hit shift enter, Mathematica gives us this uh, polynomial that goes through those three points. So now I can do a plot. Um, so let's actually hide these. We don't need them anymore. Um, and let's delete this. So uh, let's do a plot. Of f of x and p of x. With x going from a to b. And I made a mistake here. This should be capital P. Okay, so we see that the blue line is the function and the orange line is the polynomial. And we see that they coincide here, here, and here in these three points. Uh, but uh, there's no need why, there's no reason why they should coincide in other points. And indeed, they don't quite coincide. But as you increase the number of green points and uh, the number of grid points and uh, and therefore the order of the polynomial, uh, then the accuracy should get better. And uh, these two lines should get closer and closer. So let's try more points here. Let's put four. And uh, let's do the plot again. So now they are much closer to each other that I cannot uh, distinguish them. So to get a better idea of what is happening, we can plot their difference f minus p. So the difference is 0 0.001. Uh, so that's not too bad for, for five points. And we can try more points. And the difference seems to be getting smaller and smaller. So let's try 10. OK, so this is good. The, the difference, again, is getting smaller. but. We see something that we don't like here near the edges, that the error seems to be smaller in the middle and higher near the edges. Um, this is typical for, uh, equidistant, for equidistant grid points. To see the error a little better, I can uh, specify here. I can use the, the option plot range 
and then all to make sure that everything is, is visible here. Okay, so the error is 10 to minus 6, not too bad. Um, now let's change the interval a little bit. Let's, let's go from minus 1 to 1. So this means I'm interpolating over a larger area. Uh, let's start again with a few points. Let's say 5 points. Okay, so the two polynomials... The, 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 this polynomial uh, interpolates the function over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 grid points. Um, and let's increase the order and see what happens. 6, 8, 10, let's go 16, and so on. Uh, and you can see that the error here keeps increasing. Although the approximation seems to be getting better in the middle, we actually have a very nasty divergence near the edges. So the error keeps getting worse and worse as the order increases. We can also show the grid points on this plot. So I can say... Um, list plot and then uh, introduce these data points x y and then I can say I can use comma to suppress this plot and this list plot and then I can use the command show to show the last result and the one before that. So this is percent percent is the one before that and percent is the last result. And this ensures that we show the these data points on this plot. So I can increase the number of group points, let's say 32 and you see that the accuracy keeps getting better here in the middle, but it actually keeps getting a lot worse near the edges. Okay, so this is uh, known as the Runge phenomenon. It has been mathematically shown that uh, for Lagrange interpolation and for equidistant uh, nodes, uh, in general, as you increase the number of grid points, you will get a divergence. Uh, and this function is called the Runge function because it's been demonstrated mostly for this function. It doesn't happen for all functions. If you have some relatively simple functions like sine of x and e to the x, uh, they are well behaved. This doesn't happen. Uh, but that's the exception rather than the rule. So there are a few ways to avoid this phenomenon. Uh, one way is to just do the interpolation in a small region and then treat the problem in a piecewise manner. So you can use one interpolation, one interpolating polynomial in this region and then another one here and another one here, another one here and so on. Uh, so that means you're using uh, low order polynomials to cover patches of this uh, grid. Uh, in a piecewise manner. In. And this is a method that is most commonly used uh, for doing polynomial interpolation. Uh, another way to avoid this problem is to use nodes that are not equidistant. So in particular we notice that the problem occurs in near the edges and if we use grid points that are more dense near the edges and less dense near the middle, uh, we can improve this behavior. Uh, and in particular, let's consider points that are not equidistant uh, on this axis, but uh, are equidistant on a circle. And let's take the projections of these points on the real axis. Then uh, you see that these points are more dense here and less dense in the middle. Um, 
you can see that these points are going to be given by a cosine function. So let's go back to our slides. Okay, so uh, the claim is that the Runge phenomenon can be mitigated if we use nodes that are distributed more densely near uh, the edges. Uh, so interpolation using the Chebyshev Gauss Lobato nodes that I just showed uh, that are given by this formula. Uh, so we have points going from A to B, but we have a cosine here. Um, so these grid points are equidistant in the angle theta. In other words, uh, they're equidistant uh, on the circle, the, un the unit circle. Um, so this kind of interpolation, can, it can be shown that it converges uniformly for every absolutely continuous function. Um, these nodes, in particular, are the extrema of a Chebyshev polynomial of degree n. Uh, if all the function derivatives are bounded on the interval uh, a from a to b, it can be shown that uh, Chebyshev interpolation has the property of exponential convergence. And uh, you can check that in Mathematica. So let's call this uh, formula. Let's call this up in, in Mathematica. So um, I'm going to copy paste this code. Uh, but I'm going to change one line. Uh, so I've changed the line where the points were equidistant and instead now they're given by these uh, Chebyshev Gauss Lobato nodes that are equidistant in, on the unit circle. Uh, and let's try uh, a few points. Let's try, let's start with eight and show the function interpolation. This is the interpolating polynomial. You can see that the nodes are more uh, dense here and less dense in the middle. So let's increase the number of grid points and see what happens. So let's try 16. You see that things get better. And then let's try 32. Now things get a lot better. Uh, you can see that the problem that we had before with the nasty oscillations, the Runge phenomenon near the edges, uh, this does not happen anymore. Uh, you can see that this nasty error that is very small here, very large here. Instead, now what we have is uh, an error that is more uniformly distributed. So the error in the edges and the error in the middle are, are comparable in magnitude. And uh, it, this is actually a prob property of Chebyshev interpolation that the error is uniformly distributed. So you can keep increasing the number of grid points without fear that of a Runge phenomenon anymore. So 64 and we're getting an accuracy of 10 to minus 6. So uh, it's pretty as amazing that we cover this whole region with a single polynomial. Uh, this is impossible or very hard to do when you're using a good distant grid points. Uh, but with Chebyshev grid points, uh, y you can do that. And let's try a very large number of grid points, 128. The accuracy is of order 10 to minus 12. And if we double that to 256, then we, s we hit uh, machine precision, basically. So it does not get any more accurate than that unless you use software arithmetic. Okay, so this will wrap it up for this video. We've talked about uh, the method of the undetermined coefficients and Lagrange interpolation uh, using equidistant nodes or Chebyshev nodes. And in, in the next video, we will talk about Hermite interpolation. Thank you.